this Shabbos is uh, is Shabbos Mevarchem Adar, right? It's the beginning. Uh, we could so I think it's it's appropriate. And it's never too early to talk about Perm a little bit and things like that. So it happens to be this year. Um, this year there's something that uh, we kind of notice, and other years we wouldn't have a chance to notice, which is the fact that this year we have two others, right? So it's a leap year. We have two others. Now when is Perm? So Perm the Gemara says whenever you have a leap year. Purim we hold, Purim is not the first Adar, right? we wait for it to be the second Adar, why? So the reason is, as the Gemara puts it, we want to connect Purim to Pesach. To connect Purim to Pesach. So the question we're going we're gonna to try to figure out now is that why is that? What's the connection exactly between Purim and Pesach? The truth is that if we think about it more, there's a bunch of uh, connections really between those two holidays. Again, first of all, the fact that the Gemara says that we, by two Adars we put Purim in the second one, for it to flow into Pesach, that's one. Second of all, we know that Haman, when he was trying to pick which month to destroy the Jewish people, he picked the month of Adar, why? And specifically uh, Zion Adar, because that was the day that Moshe died. And so Moshe, the hero of Pesach, right, his death in Haman's mind allowed him to destroy the Jewish people. And as the Gemara puts it, Haman's downfall was the fact that although Moshe died Zion Adar, he was also born Zion Adar. So in other words, the redeemer of Pesach is ultimately the force that, that also helped us out of Purim, that gave us the Yantav of Purim. <clears throat> also just in general, in terms of, of the enemies of the Jewish people, we seem to have these two main enemies. Amalek, certainly, Haman, Reish is Gaim Amalek. But also if you think about it in terms of Jewish history, the first exile, and the first enemy the Jewish people really ever had was Mitzrayim, was Egypt. And so on the one hand, we have these two arch enemies. We have the nation of Amalek, and certainly, we also have the nation of Egypt, of Mitzrayim. So much so that there's a special myth in the Torah of the Jewish people not to return to Egypt. So it's, it's something we have to think about, the connection and the relationship between Egypt and Amalek. Egypt and Amalek. Okay, let's put all that to the side, but Zashem will get to it. In the beginning of the parasha, so this, whole, this week's parasha, parasha's Mishpatim, is all about uh, very practical laws. It's talking about people fighting with each other, injuries, uh, you know, uh, lost objects, I mean, practical, down-to-earth stuff. And the parasha begins, These are the laws that you should present before them, Hashem says to Moshe. Now Rashi already comments on the first letter, and these are the laws. And Rashi brings down from Chazal that whenever you have the word and, it always means a connection between what you're saying now to what was said before. You said something, and this. So Rashi says, what's the and? So the and is saying that in the last week's parsha we had Har Sinai, the giving of the Torah, the Ten Commandments. So, and these are the laws as well. It says Rashi, it's coming to say, Ma elu mi Sinai, af elu mi Sinai. Just like the Ten Commandments were said at Sinai, so too these laws are also part of that whole experience of Har Sinai. Okay, so the question is how do we make sense of that? What exactly does that mean? Why? why these laws in particular, what's really the connection between this parsha and all the practical laws and the experience of Har Sinai. Right, so I'll share with you an idea like this. We all, you know, those of us here that are parents and Bez Hashem, those that will be parents, we, we you know, it, it's not an easy job to be a parent, you know what I mean? It's not an easy job. And, and it's, it's impossible to be perfect, every parent makes a mistake. But let me explain, let me describe a little bit of, you know, a, a possible mistake that parents often make, whether it be fathers or mothers. There's such a thing where a parent, again, a father or a mother, is somewhat overbearing in the life of the child. There's such a phenomenon. I don't know, maybe if some of you have heard of stories like that or, or met people like that. There's such a thing. Now, what's interesting is, is that whenever you have a father or a mother, that's their presence in the child's life is overwhelming. They usually are, are in two different ways. So for example, again, this, it's a stereotype, so it's not always 100%, but it's uh, most of the time like this. When a, father, when a father's presence is, is tremendously you know, overwhelming in the child's life, it's usually, it's usually in terms of schar v'aynish, you know, reward and punishment, the discipline, the disciplinary side of the father, that could be somewhat overbearing. And so what happens when you, know, when you have a father um, who, in terms of the, being a disciplinarian, is, is, is overwhelming the life of the child. Well, what happens is one of two options. Either the child very often will just rebel, completely run away from that, and specifically break all the rules just to, just to you know, try to have some level of independence and so on. 
or the person is, or the child is like, you know, uh, you, you know, it, it melts into the shell of a person to the point of where he's, uh, he or she is petrified to do anything because of you know, the fear of punishment or whatever it is that the father, you know, so to speak, has over the child. That's one type of overbearing presence. When a, mo a mother is also can sometimes be overbearing, uh, and you'll see why I'm talking about this. It's not like a psychology class, but you'll see when a mother the stereotypical mother that's overbearing is not so much in like reward and punishment, but it's in just overwhelming love and presence. So that sounds like a good thing, but the truth is that could also be debilitating, right? When a mother is overwhelming the child's life, so that can lead into a child not having a healthy, developed sense of self. And so you could have a person, you could have a child who uh, unfortunately might be like sort of even even emotionally handicapped and underdeveloped as an adult because of the overbearing presence of parents. So that's, that's an example, that's, a, that's when the parents are just too much. Let's go the opposite extreme. Let's say you have a scenario where the parents are completely non-existent. So there's no discipline at all. The father is not a, a disciplinary, there's no disciplinary father presence at all, so it's not like that at all. The mother is completely un unpresent. There's no warm embrace. There's no sense of, uh, of love and, 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 and sort of an envelopment in the home. That could also lead to terrible problems, right? That's absolute chaos. So the kids could also grow up without any discipline. The kids are vildechais, they're wild animals, right? Without any um, warm embrace and presence of the mother or, or a loving figure like that also, the child can become emotionally uh, underdeveloped as well. And so, the, the, the beauty of being a the, the, you know, the challenge of being a parent, I can say, is finding a healthy balance and knowing when in the life of the child does, do, does the child need right now the presence of a father, the presence of a mother, or does the child need right now for the parent, for the father mother to take a step back and allow the child to make his or her mistakes and to sort of uh, feel things out and develop themselves as a person. And being a skilled parent is one who is able to make that balance, knowing the right time for things, that sometimes the child needs the presence of the parents to be there, and sometimes the child needs the parents to take a step back. Now, obviously, as human beings, we all make mistakes like that, so our parents have made mistakes with us, and we'll probably make mistakes with our kids. That's just the way it is. And what's amazing about a human being is that we're more resilient than we think. We can handle mistakes, you know what I mean? It's uh, most traumas a person can get over. <clears throat> So those are, those are two examples, again, two extremes in terms of a parent. Again, an overbearing presence, and which could lead to difficulty, and a completely absent parent also leading to terrible difficulty. So it is with the Rabbani Shlom as well. Hashem is called our father, right? Hashem is called a parent. So there is such a thing, there is such a thing, where a person can feel the presence of Hashem in one's life to such an extent where it's actually debilitating. What do I mean? So Hashem is, let's say, a father, right? So Hashem, so a person can have a relationship with God in such a way where Hashem could also be in their lives overbearing. Chas v'shalom. Now what do I mean? Not that God is overbearing at all, but in your own mind, Hashem can seem overbearing. And that is, the example is, where a person feels a sense of reward and punishment and a person sees God as that disciplinarian type to such an extent, to the point of where you're, you're, you're traumatized in fear. You don't even know how to function. There is such a thing where a person can feel overwhelmed by that sense of discipline. There is such a thing. Uh, and the, uh, the, the same thing is, uh, now, now, when that happens, so what do you do then? So a little bit later on in the parsha, it's an amazing thing, a little bit later on in the parsha, there's a mitzvah called Tina and Prika. Tina and Prika. Tina and Prika means the following thing. The Pasuk says, let's say you're walking down the street and you see, uh, you see a donkey, whatever, lo laid down with packages. So the mitzvah is, the Torah says, if you see that donkey laid down with packages and you find that the animal is being weighed down and it's in a lot of pain, so there's a mitzvah tzar by the chaim to unload the burden of the animal, to take off the packages. Okay. Then the Torah says as well, it's hinted to in the Pasuk, let's say another scenario. You're walking down the block, you see a donkey walking down, and the packages are all falling off. And the owner of the packages is going to lose his stuff. So then the mitzvah is the opposite. Take the packages that are falling off and load it back up on the donkey. 
Okay, that's a mitzvah. Very simple. Each scenario, I think, makes a lot of sense. You don't want to have the packages overburden the donkey, but if it's all falling away and it's going to become lost, then obviously you try to, you try to put it back on. <clears throat> In Hasidus, we're taught that every single mitzvah is not just a practical thing like that specific scenario, but it's telling us something about ourselves. It's telling us something about our relationship with God. So what can we learn from those two mitzvahs? So there's a sefer called the Beis Yaakov. Rabbi Yankel Ishbitzer, the Beis Yaakov writes the following thing. He says a phenomenal point. He says there is such a phenomenon where a Jew, like that donkey, is walking around and is weighed down, weighed down by the packages of Yiddishkeit. Now what do I mean? What it means is that there is such a phenomenon where a Jew walks around and for whatever reason, it's been drilled into this person's head that what is God? God is someone that looks down from the clouds, whatever it is, and takes an accounting of everything that you do, which is true, we believe in that. And that's the entire picture of who God is. And the person walking through life like that could become similar to that donkey who's weighed down by his burdens. To the point of where the, the guilt, sometimes, of a mistake, or the fear of making the future mistake, is so overwhelming that one of two things happen. Either the person says, I don't want such a God. I'm not interested. I'm, I'm opting out of the entire program because it's, so, it's just too difficult. It's too overwhelming. That's one option. Or the person shrivels up to become a cowardice, you know, uh, you know yellow belly chicken. You know what I mean? To the point of where they can't, they can't function. Everything, to, to make any decision in life, they have to quickly, you know, uh, call them a kubble to get, uh, you know, to check the names, whatever it is. Uh, you know, all these types of things. So that's a scenario of where you have a donkey being weighed down by his burdens. A f again, a similar scenario to this in terms of parents. There's such a thing as, as seeing Hashem as a fa an overbearing father. Or seeing Hashem as an overbearing mother. Someone that you can't, you know, uh, Hashem is always there. And, and these, the, the, you know, you, you kind of feel overwhelmed by that. So you know what the Pasuk says? If you see a donkey like that, then you take off the packages. What does that mean? Said the Beis Yaakov, it means... It means that when you see a Jew like that, who, who doesn't have enough confidence and feels overwhelmed by the sense of responsibility of what happens if I make a mistake and, you know, all that type of thing, then the Torah says, then that's the type of Jew that you have to tell him the following thing. You have to say, listen, buddy, of course Yiddishkeit, is, it's, it, there's, you know, details and everything is taken into account and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, no matter what happens, it's going to be okay. Like, God has your back. It's going to be okay. Like, don't worry about it. Don't feel overwhelmed by that. In other words, in other words, you know, it, it's like anything else. We, 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 if a, we, there's, there's so many statements in Chazal that, 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 that talk to our relationship with God in a way that's, that's a love that's not bound to anything, that's not dependent on anything, you know? And when you have a Jew that's overburdened by the packages of responsibility and is weighed down by the guilt of previous mistakes or coming mistakes, then such a Jew, you have to alleviate that, that weight. And the way to alleviate that weight is to remind them that with all that being said, and it's all true that everything is taken into account, but with all that being said, it's going to be okay. Like Hashem promised, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Now let's say the opposite scenario. Let's say you have a Jew who's like that donkey walking around, and the packages are falling off. So what's that? What does that mean? That means you have Jews that are like, who, who cares what I do? It doesn't matter. Nothing matters anyway. No, there's no significance to any of my actions to begin with. I choose this, I choose that. What's the difference anyway? I'm just a speck of dust that's flying through space. No one's paying attention to me anyway. So that person is going through life like the donkey where the packages are just falling to the wayside, where there's no sense of responsibility at all. Well, to that Jew, you have to then take out your other notebook full of statements of Chazal that say, no, 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 what you do is very important. And what you do is very significant. And Hashem is paying attention to everything. And you do have responsibilities in life, and you do have, have power. You know? And that's the balance that a person has to make. I'll give you an example. You know, when, when you think of the, the, the whole story of Mitzrayim, right? the whole, when Moshe Rabbeinu first came to Paro, right, and told Paro, like the, the famous line, you know, uh, let my people go, right, basically. Shalach ami v'yavduni, send my nation and they'll serve me. So what was Paro's response? Paro's response was, mi Hashem, who's God that I should listen to his voice? The entire exile of Mitzrayim 
was one of that donkey where the packages had just fallen to the wayside. The whole exile of Egypt was one, there was a culture of less than less dying, that there's no justice, there's no judge. It's Hefker. The world is Hefker. The world is meaningless. You do not need any sense of responsibility. You do not, your actions do not carry any weight. And therefore, just do what you want. That was what Egypt was. That's what Egypt was. That's what the whole Indian of the Jewish people being slaves in Egypt. What's a slave? A slave is someone who doesn't have any responsibility for themselves, right? They do it, you know, it's just, there's nothing there. There's such a phenomenon where a Jew goes through life less than, less dying, there's no judge, there's no justice, there's no system, I'm just a speck of dust flo floating through space. Well, with such a perspective, that was what Paro said. Who's God that I should listen to him? Like, like there's no, what are you, what are you talking about religion? You're talking about uh, responsibility? I don't know what you're talking about. So to respond to that, what, what does Hashem do? The whole story of Pesach, the whole story of the Exodus is what? Hashem says, no, 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 no. I'm very much there. I'm very much there. Every single plague, every single miracle, heavens open up and like unbelievable things start taking place. Pesach is, 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 is taking those packages which are falling off the donkey and putting it back on. That's what Pesach is. Pesach is balancing, therefore. The whole, the whole story of the Exodus is balancing the claim of Paro, which is that the world is Hefker. That there's no God, there's no justice, there's no sense of responsibility, there's no parent. Mitzrayim basically is like a house run without any parents. That's what it was. There's no, there's no, forget overbearing father and mother, there's no father and mother. There's nothing there, and just the house is running on Hefker. It's completely, it's completely Hefker. So to respond to that, Moshe Rabbeinu says, I'm, I'll show you that there's a father and a mother. There's, there for sure is. And Hashem opens up uh, his, you know, his, uh, his, na you know, his suitcase full of uh, crazy stuff, and he shows the world. Is din vizdain. There is a judge. There's justice, and and everything is measure for measure. But then you now let's juxtapose that with the story of Perm. It's interesting. What's Perm? Perm is the opposite. When Haman comes to Achashverosh and says to him. You know, I have an idea, yes, no, Amecha, there's a nation, they're making trouble, we should just get rid of Klal Yisrael. So what does, what according to Chazal, what does Achashir respond to Haman? He says, I'm afraid of their God. Look what happened in the past, you know, Parai and Nebuchadnezzar. Look at the past, it's, it's riddled with the, uh, you know, with the attempted uh, destruction of the Jewish people. And anyone that tried that, their God always smites and always destroys. What does Haman respond? Does Haman respond, there is no God? No. That's what Haman says. Haman says, Yeshenim in HaMitzvahs. Haman says that the Jewish people aren't deserving of their God's protection. Because they're all asleep. They're not really keeping Torah and Mitzvahs properly. What is Haman? What is Amalek? Whereas Mitzrayim was the philosophy of less than Vlestine. There is no judge, there is no justice. Do what you want because life doesn't matter anyway. Haman and Amalek is the exact opposite. Haman and Amalek, they're... they're um, uh, uh, their way of trying to undermine the Jewish people, their, uh, their, their approach is what? It's not that there's no judge and there's no justice. Quite the opposite. Their objective is to make the Jewish people feel overburdened by the presence of the parent. It's to make us feel that everything we do is so weighty and our mistakes are so, are so significant to the point of where there's no room for us to function anymore. Yeshayim and Amitzis, they don't deserve, they, they don't deserve God to help them because God is watching them with such a fine tooth comb, taking everything into account and measuring exactly what they deserve, what they don't deserve, to the point of where they don't deserve anything. So if Mitzrayim is a house that's run without parents, Haman is a house where there's an overbearing father and mother, to the point of where it doesn't allow the child to grow and to, and to have any sense of inner confidence. So what's the response to Haman? The response to Haman is the Yantav of Purim. What's the Yantav of Purim? Do whatever you want. It's okay. Like, uh, usually getting drunk is not so good. Purim, it's okay. A little bit. You know, usually, you know, everything's about discipline and order. Purim is, uh, whatever you do, the Rabbani Shalom has your back. That's the idea. In other words, it's too, it's, if Pesach, Pesach is a Yantav where the packages are falling off the donkey, we try to put the packages on. Purim is a Yantav where the packages are weighing down the donkey and we take off the packages. That's what's going on. And that's also, again, why we always try to connect Purim into Pesach. The reason is because both of them together, the balance between Purim and Pesach, that's, that's the perfect Jew. That's a Jew that, has, that feels that his actions are significant and takes responsibility for himself, 
but is not overwhelmed by that sense of responsibility. It is not overwhelmed by the presence of the parent. It's not overwhelmed by that. And it's comfortable enough and secure enough in the relationship between him and the parent, and the Rabbanish Lailam, to have the confidence to go about life and to sometimes make a mistake if that happens. And to be willing to, to take those risks if necessary. See, again, that, that's also part of it, that when, when a, a child who's raised in a home where the parents are overbearing, uh, very often the child doesn't have the confidence to, to take any risks and to move forward in life because of what happens if they mess up, right? Either they don't have the confidence to do it or they're afraid of the punishment if they fail, right? And again, and mitzat sheni, if there's no parent at all, so then the, the kid's life is hefker. You know what I mean? And there's no, there's no order to anything. And there's nothing motivating him to make a choice. There's nothing pushing him to move forward in life. Because it's, it's all meaningless. <clears throat> the perfect balance of having a person who takes responsibility and who's confident enough in himself and his relationship with God to be able to, 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 to take a step forward in life and to, and, to, uh, and, and, to, and to make those choices and to deal with the repercussions of possibly making a mistake in those choices, right? That's someone who has a healthy balance of Purim Pesach, who recognizes Hashem's presence in his life, recognizes how Hashem is paying attention to everything you do, but is not overwhelmed by that, and, and has a relationship with God in a way that, that it's not only defined based on reward and punishment and calculations. There's something deeper than that. And that, that, that's, that's that balance that Purim Pesach is coming to bring. This is what our parsha is about as well. As I mentioned, the, the whole Indian of, uh, of, of last week's Parsha connecting with this week's Parsha. So, just for a couple minutes, last week's Parsha, if you just compare the two, they're very, very different. Kalal Yisrael by Harsinai, you're standing by Harsinai, and we're experiencing like Hashem revealing Himself to us, right? It's, that's an overwhelming experience. That's us completely being swallowed up by the embrace of our Creator. So Hashem opens up the heaven, and we see that what, like when Shabbat describes, like we saw that there is, there's nothing but the one God. Like everything is God, and He tells us this is what you have to do. Don't steal, don't kill. It, it's mamish, mamish an unbelievable presence. And then you move to the sixth parsha. What's the sixth parsha? Ve'il ha'meshpatim ha'shatasim l'fneim. Ve'il ha'meshpatim is what? It's, deal, it's, it's describing people making mistakes. People having the confidence of dealing with each other in business and trying to figure out how to, how to navigate that. That's what Mishpatim is about. You know, uh, damages, how to deal with damages, what happens if a person steals and they can't pay back, what do you do? It's dealing with, with, with a possibility of mistakes. It's dealing with people that are willing, that are confident enough, and, are, and are, sort of have their own identity enough to go out in life and to make something of themselves. Yes, and when you do that, there's going to be some issues, and there's going to be, uh, you know, conflicts with other people. That's the way it is. See, th this is the, the great contrast between the parashas. Parashas Yisrael, where we're standing by our Sinai, we're so lost in Hashem's presence that the possibility of us going to work and starting a business and having to deal with, with uh, arguments amongst employees, like, it doesn't, it's not even on the radar. What are you talking about? Like, I'm completely lost by our Sinai. And then you have Parshas Mishpatim, which is that we're completely out of our Sinai and we're making something of ourselves and, and we're dealing with, uh, with the difficulty that comes with that. And that letter Vav, that, that is the beginning of our Parsha, connecting the two, that's the mystery. Ve'elam Mishpatim, and these are the laws. What Hashem is saying to us with that letter Vav is that a healthy Jew is someone that's able to bring the two together. That you're, you still have the presence of our Sinai, but you're not overwhelmed by that. And because of that, you have the presence of Har Sinai. You have the, the, the recognition of Hashem is in your life. But it's not, but your relationship with Him is not one that you feel so overwhelmed by that, by that presence to the point of where you can't go and accomplish things in life. So that, that's, what, that's what Yisro to Mishpatim is about. It's about giving the Jewish people the ability to relate to Hashem in a way that certainly, certainly we will we'll take, we'll, we'll, you know, certainly there's a, there's a presence there. But it's not overwhelming. It still allows us to function as normal, healthy human beings. And when we do that, when you find that balance, that's, just like in human beings, that's a healthy parent-child relationship. That's a healthy, you know, Knesset Yisrael and, the Jew and Hashem's relationship. Again, it's one where the Rabbani Shalom is very much there, but we're not overwhelmed by that presence. 
and allows us, it allows us to function, to be the people that we're supposed to become. And when that happens, it's no different than, than any, any, any uh, again, any family where the child is able to become who they can become. I said, Baruch Hashanah, we should become people like that, to, to again, always remember that Baruch is there, but remember that that, 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 Relationship is one that's supposed to give you confidence and give you strength to become who you can become and to and to go into the world and to conquer territory, not to be someone that's overwhelmed by that and and uh, and always hiding from that because of that. All right. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. Thank